Hello, praise God. Thank God for being here. The first thing I want to do is pray. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to please, please bless this program. Please bless the connections. Lord, there's something that the enemy is fighting on tonight. And it seems as if every time I get on this platform, there is a fight. But we're claiming victory on tonight, God, because what we're doing, we're doing to your glory. And we're doing it for your honor, dear God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Hello, everyone. I am so excited uh, to introduce my guest on tonight. Let me read Amanda McLaughlin's bio. Amanda L. McLaughlin, MSW, an ordained minister who's passionate about youth, families, and communities, is our guest. Amanda earned her master's degree at the University of South Carolina College of Social Work and her bachelor's degree of social work and psychology with a concentration in counseling from Coker University. She is employed with Youth Villages as a family intervention specialist, providing intensive services for youth ages 6 to 18 with mental health, truancy, and juvenile justice issues, as well as providing support for their families. Amanda is also employed with Harvest Christian Fellowship, located in Knoxville, Tennessee, under the leadership of lead pastor Sharon Q. Farugia. Hope I didn't mess her name up. She serves as the community outreach pastor and junior high youth pastor. Some specific areas of outreach where free meals are prepared for the community include love and lemonade, friends with food, cocoa and hugs, and the Harvest Food Pantry. Love in a Box is a ministry designed to share love with individuals who need encouragement during sickness or other difficult times. Another area of outreach is comfort and care. Developed to serve families in times of loss and grief. She says, we offer a box filled with love, basic necessities for hosting family and guests, and a note of prayer, all into God's glory in honor of our beloved Steve Hauser, who passed away in 2020. Amanda formerly served as executive director of South Carolina Church of God of Prophecy State Camping Ministry. She served local South Carolina churches for 28 years in various roles, including associate pastor, youth, children, and student ministry pastor, etc. Amanda has served in roles as assistant professor of social work and field education coordinator at Coker University. She has assisted with training and development in multiple group homes for displaced youth and worked in retail store management for 10 years. In all areas of life, Amanda's heart is to serve humans with the grace of love of Jesus to the best of her ability. And I introduce to some and present to others, Amanda McLaughlin. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Dr. Motley. How are you? I'm doing good. It's such an honor to be here tonight with you and be asked to be on your program. I am so thankful to have you here, although you know we've had some challenges, but we're going to get through this and I know it's going to be a blessing to others. I would like to um, ask you, prior to your current position in Tennessee, you served 
as executive director of South Carolina Church of God Prophecy State Camping Ministry. And you worked for 28 years serving various ministries. Please elaborate on your role as associate pastor and your role as youth, children, and student ministry pastor. Well, to give you a little bit of a background, I started out really young. Um, it doesn't seem like I'm old enough to have that many years of experience, serving experience, but um, I grew up in little churches, small church um, all my life, um, Pentecostal churches. Um, I was saved at 11 years old, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, however you want to reference him. Um, and I start, you know, and when the small churches you have, there's always a need. There's always something that needs to be done. And, you know, and so that's how I got started. I got started in children, teaching children's church around 12 years old. Um, as I got older, the passion for ministry to serve others grew. And the more I served wholeheartedly, the more God opened doors and opportunities, opportunities for me to expand in other areas of ministry. Um, and in every area of my life, even as student ministries, um, associate, a lot of times those roles were the all together at one time, um, also in multiple areas. Um, but one of the scriptures I, I've always, I've always tried to remember and apply to my life, especially in difficult times, is Colossians three and twenty three. It says, "Whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly unto the Lord and not unto men." And it kind of you know, brings things back in perspective, especially when you're working with people and serving people. Mm-hmm. So over these 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 ministry opportunities, I've been able. Outreach has always been on my heart. Um, God always seems to send those kids that are troubled and have needs and have issues. And, you know, and I can remember on some nights um, in youth service, we'd have 45 kids from the community who would walk to church just to be a part. Um, we would serve, you know, in the small beginnings, we'd serve snacks and serve food and stuff to them. And we'd play games. And then it was time for church. We had church. Um, but I grew up watching, and I think it's very important to understand, even as from the church perspective, I grew up watching and being trained by the grandmothers, mothers, and fathers of the church. I was right there with them at a young age. Um, and we were always cooking and grilling and raising funds and doing something in the church. And I was right there watching that. And I learned from the start, you know, you serve. You serve other people and you do it with joy and happiness. And mm-hmm. um and so as I grew up, I just rolled over on into youth ministry and student ministry. Um, mm-hmm. And I call student ministry youth and children together because um, I did youth and children together for a while, too, especially when it was outreach in the community outreach and that kind of stuff. Um, and I realized at a young age that when well, younger that everybody, some, when you're new in Christ, you're all on the same playing field. You know, if you don't know anything about the Bible or Jesus, whether you're, you know, eight years old or whether you're 30 years old or 60 years old, you're all on the same level. So I was able to teach and preach and minister, you know, to everybody on the same level and watch God do some amazing transformations in people's lives. Awesome. Awesome. While in uh, this state of South Carolina, you also held the position of assistant professor of social work. And prior to that, you were, the field education coordinator at Coca University. Elaborate a little for our audience regarding each of those positions. Well, I'm a firm believer that God opens every door. And this is a door that God opened for me at Coca University um, in the behavioral sciences department, which was where social work was under. Um, I was able to, you know, serving with the students in our social work program um, was one of the greatest blessings of my career in my life. Um, I was able to help teach and work with those students who were actually adult learners. And I I found so much value in in that because we were able to pull off each other's experiences. A lot of times God would come up in those conversations when the older, the older, you know, I didn't say the older congregation, (laughs) but with the older students. God would come up and how God and how our faith and stuff interacts in social work and how we were able to interact and and intertwine our faith into what we were doing and why we were doing what we were doing. Um, And God just really just blessed in those situations. And even in the classroom, I'm still connected to to most of my students. Um, But the field education program 
you know, COCRA is um, it's a cornerstone of social work education. Um, where students get to take all the theoretical and the concept, conceptual knowledge that they learn in that classroom setting, and they're able to connect it in the practical world and in the practical settings that they're in. Um, the practice settings that we were able to put students in, they were able to gain the skills to be confident in what they were doing, confident in what they learned, um, opportunities to watch and learn, but also to put those things into practice. Um, and it was a safe place for them to be able to do that. Um, and so that was the that was what field education was. And it was a learning experience for them and me. We learned from each other. It was a give and take. Very good. Also, I see that you currently work with youth villages as a family intervention specialist with youth ages six to 18 who have mental health, truancy and juvenile justice issues. Can you elaborate? Um, on some of the specific kinds of mental health problems that you observed regarding youth? Okay. Well, right now, um, as a family intervention specialist with Youth Villages, um, I have I have a caseload of five, five to six kids I see each week, and I see them three times a week in their home in their local community. Um, and the things that I am, the biggest issues that I am seeing, and I've been seeing for the last two years while, a well, year and a half while I've been working with them, um, a lot of kids have very high anxiety, very high anxiety, a lot of depression. Um, it seems to be the basis of what a lot of the issues are coming from. Um, we deal with kids with post-traumatic stress disorder, suicidal ideations, suicidal attempts, um, self-harm, extreme verbal and physical aggression inappropriate sexual behaviors, um, delinquency, truancy, low self-esteem, drug and alcohol use. Um, I'm in a poor, poor community up at the top of one of our mountains nearby that surrounds Knoxville. Um, and a lot of it, I've, I've noticed, and it's not scientifically proven, but I've noticed with the kids I've worked with, a lot of this is coming out more after they've been able, they've been quarantined at home these kids are not being able to adjust going back to school. Um, a lot of a lot of the kids are not adjusting well. Um, they, they're not going back into the classrooms well and being able to cope with the, the noise. I've had a lot of kids I've had to equip with earplugs to go back to school because they can't deal with the noise that they're being home for so long. Um, their anxiety is through the and I And I really believe that COVID, even though it was a physical physical thing, it also was a spiritual thing, is how my thing is, it was a spiritual attack also. Um, and so the anxiety and depression that these kids are, these kids are dealing with, I've had teachers tell me where the kids were perfectly fine. We had COVID, they come back and completely different children who cannot cope with life. Um, that seems to be the biggest thing. There's other issues too, but the biggest ones that are seem to top all of them is the high anxiety and depression of these children. I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. And I understand too, that when you do the kind of work that you do, there has to be some form of therapeutic framework utilized for the sessions that you uh, run uh, with the children. So what therapeutic framework do you utilize in your counseling and intervention techniques? Well, we provide, um, Youth for Villages provides us like a systematic approach to family treatment. Uh, we analyze all the systems that interact with the families. We, we work, we're involved in their community. We're involved in their individual life, their school, their religion, their peer, the family history. We look at all of it um, to better understand all the possible drivers um, for the behavioral issues the children may be presenting um, with the play that's placing them at risk for disruption from their family. Because these kids are about to be taken out taking out their families or being removed. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we use what we use and utilize is called collaborative problem solving. And mm -hmm. we use do that to understand how to help create an effective and durable solutions um, to the problems they face. This means that we look at the children, the children and families and say, not this, you know, because so many times people say, well, they don't want to. And it's mm -hmm. not necessarily they don't want to do well. It's that can they do well? Are they equipped to do well? Mm -hmm. um, and so we look at it from that perspective and try to change that framework of the family. Why like they just don't want to. Well, there's got to be a reason. 
It's not that they're not wanting to do well. What's the reason behind why they're not doing well? So basically it's my job to figure out what the reason is <laughs> um, and help them build the skills needed to meet those expectations to reach success. Um, much like you would do with any other student who um, is not able to master math or, re or reading concepts and that kind of thing um, mm -hmm. consistently, so consistently, I'm sorry. Um, you'd see what the learning, when you would, with math and reading, you see what the learning issue is and then help them build skills around it. And that's the same thing we do with the behaviors in the home. Okay. So what I heard you say, and correct me if I'm uh, incorrect, I heard behaviors theory mm -hmm. and I heard learning theory. Right. Okay. Um, which are two theories that have been actually proven to be very um, beneficial in working yes. with children and adolescents. Um, I want to ask you, what type of support do you provide or does your agency provide to the families of your clients? We are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I'm available from, well, they call me any time of the day, but um, I'm supposed to be only available between eight o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but, I, I have a hard time always telling them no, not to call me on the off time because I understand the frustration of having to repeat your story and what's going on and catch people up over and over and over again. And I try mm -hmm. to save them from having to do that. I'm like, just call me. Cause usually I can handle it in a few seconds when it takes somebody else an hour. Um, but we provide that in, we provide intensive home therapy three times a week. Um, most of the time it's three to six months. Um, sometimes it can go out to nine months. It all depends on the child, the family connection with the family and the community. Um, we help the families identify supports and family supports. Um, and like I said, we, we support that too. A lot of times I've found that families don't, when they're having trouble, they don't want their immediately, they don't want their other family members to know what's going on. True, true. Most of the time they know anyway. Um, but they don't want them to know. And so instead of looking at it as a, um, looking at it as a problem, we address it as these could be helps for you. You know, this could be a respite option. They can go here for a couple of hours and give you a break. They, you know, and we identify, I've had people, I've identified pastors that were willing to help children's ministers, youth ministers who were willing to help, um, in the area that I work at and work in, unfortunately, there's not a lot of boys and girls clubs and those kind of things. The area really doesn't have a lot for the kids. So we're able to pull from those community resources and people who are able to step in if the family needs it. And I'm going to take the kid out, you know, men like almost like a mentoring type thing. I'll take the kid out. We'll go fishing. We'll do, you know, those kind of things. Okay. Um, for those people who might be listening um, and not quite understand what respite is, um, can you talk a little bit? I know it's not on the list of questions. No, you're good. But uh, can you talk a little bit for them to give them an understanding of what respite is? Well, respite options, sometimes you hear about them in foster care where the foster yes. family is um, yes. wants to go off. And so they'll send the, the kid to another family to stay for a couple of days while right. they go take a break. Um, in these situations, most of the time it's like what we'll do is if, there, if there's a high tense situation, high intense situation and things are going wrong in the home and they're frustrated and they're at each other, which happens a lot. These are, these are very mm -hmm. intense situations. Mm -hmm. um, we'll identify like a grandmother or a lot of times our grandmothers are the ones raising the kids. Um, mm -hmm. It'll be a pastor. Somebody, they'll go stay over there for a couple hours or they'll stay overnight or on the weekend, they'll go to this family member's house for a couple of days mm -hmm. just to give a break, a breather, so they're not in front of each other and not feeding off each other's frustration. Yes. Respite is very good because a, a lot of churches offer respite care programs for foster parents. You know, I train foster parents in this state. And so we talk to them quite a bit about respite because it sometimes they get burned out. Right. And respite can certainly help alleviate that. I see that you're also employed with Harvest Christian Fellowship in Knoxville. Um, did I ask you that question? No, How did you obtain your um, position with them? And 
and and elaborate a little bit on their programs, other programs okay. that they have. So Harvest Christian Fellowship is a church um, up here, and um, it was founded um, by Pastor Ken Dyer, or Bishop Ken Dyer back in 1995, and it started as a church plant. Um, it was part of this big city penetration type thing of seven churches that were supposed to be church plants um, back then, and we're the only one who survived. We're the ones who 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 were there, um, and so. HCF is still in, in operation. It's in fact in the community. Um, unfortunately, found pastor, pastor passed away in April of 2020. Um, he had a lot of health issues and stuff and passed away. But his associate pastor, Pastor Sharon Perugia, um, she has been there for 25 years and she took over as lead pastor, was able to carry forth, you know, all the things they were working on and God is really blessed. And so I met them about nine years ago in January. Last, mm-hmm. Next year makes nine years. And I really enjoyed what was going on. Uh, I, and I started coming from South Carolina up here to see, um, to see the visit and the help. And when I was here, basically what happens, I started, I started serving, volunteering and serving. And um, my heart has always been kind of come to, I wanted to come to Tennessee anyway, love the Knoxville area, wanted to be here. And so after many years of just showing up, serving and being here, he, he finally told me, he said, you know, um, you're going to wear your car out. Have you ever thought about moving? And I was like, no. I said, I have, but, you know, financially and whatever, I can't really right now. So a couple more years came along. And one night I was up here visiting and he called he called Pastor Sharon and said, bring Mandy, like, they call me Mandy, bring Mandy over here. I want to talk to her. And so like I said, small church, she, um, Pastor Ken set me down and he said, we don't have enough to bring you on full time or hire anybody. And so his words to me were, and it really just impacted me. Cause everything I've ever done in the church has been volunteer. Um, on any level, it's always been volunteer. And he said, I'm willing to take a pay cut and give you this money if you'll if you'll come, if you want to come. And so whether it happened or not, the fact that he offered that was huge to me. You know, so went into the next generation. And that's kind of, that's how it started. So I was able to move up here later on. He passed away and that lit a fire even more to get where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> and so I came up here and that's when I became there. So there is the visions lined up. Um, it was the first time my vision that God had given me years ago for community outreach and ministering to people lined up with another church. Mm. And God gave me a vision years ago that I would have a fully operational outreach program, outreach ministry through a church and I've been waiting and waiting for years and it's almost, you know, come to full fruition what God has, God yes. has done. And, and so that's kind of how it happened. God just keeps opening up doors. <laughs> I can't mm-hmm. tell you I've done any of it. God, God has done everything. Mm-hmm. Your gift made room for you. Right. And I know you, I've known you for years. I, um, I know your compassion and I know the heart that you have for young people. I am very impressed with your outreach. I was very impressed with your outreach in South Carolina. I was very impressed with your outreach when you were a night student and doing all the things that you were doing. Uh, I I was just so impressed because the fact of the matter is that you are a very intelligent person. And so I'm particularly impressed with love in a box and comfort and care tell me how they're similar and how they differ okay so like love in a box i actually brought the boxes with me i don't have them filled but um so love in a box our administrator also does a lot of graphic work and stuff so she created these boxes so they're little boxes and it says you see it yes that's all it says is this it says love in a box in the front and this is the smaller one. Oh, I can't find my camera. And so inside of these boxes, what we do is if you're in the hospital, if somebody if somebody's sick, if you've had an injury, we the if a kid has you know a tooth pulled or sick from school or whatever happens and they've been out for a couple of days, we'll fill these boxes. Um we'll fill these boxes with different things. Uh, most of the time, um we'll shop like 
we have a lady who who loves to, to love who loves to fill these boxes, and so we cater we catered them to specific needs to specific people. We ask you, you know, we know generally what people like um, if they're involved in our church, and so the um, children get them. They'll have candy and little toys in them. Sometimes a little gift card to McDonald's or somewhere like that. Um, the adult bought boxes uh, for the men. They'll have like coffee cups and peanuts and beef jerky just stuff stuff to say we love you it's nothing nothing major just the way to say we love you the small sometimes if you know we always in the church have repeat um those frequent flyers at the hospital <laughs> who are in there often and so if we give them a bigger box sometimes we'll give them a smaller box the next time but it'll still have a gift card in it so they can go out to eat and they get back get home and those kind of things so that's what those boxes are it's just to show a little extra love and say, we're thinking about you. We care about you. Um, inside of the top of them, they have a little card. Um, and on the card, it says, you are loved today. Um, may you know that someone is thinking of you. And it has the church address on it. And sometimes if we see them at the door, we'll we'll leave, we'll leave hand them to them. If they're not there, we'll leave it on the doorstep and we'll call, text them and tell them, hey, this is there. But these have also, these have branched out further than just our local church. We have uh, people who are working different jobs and somebody on their job has a um, an issue or health issue or something like that. They'll ask for a box and we'll send them them a box also. So it's, it's outside of the four walls of our church. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. comforting, comforting care, sorry, I might be taking too long. Comforting care is um, a different box. <laughs> we, we like boxes. <laughs> so she designed this box and it's a box on the side, has scriptures on it all the things around it. And it says, um, may the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace of, in believing so that by the power of the Holy spirit, you may be abound, you may abound in hope. And on the inside, it's more scriptures. So what goes inside of these boxes, I, I pack, I help pack these. Um, I grew up where, um, if somebody died or somebody passed, well, somebody passed away, it was always a need where the family didn't have enough paper plates, cups, napkins, trash bags, mm -hmm. lot bags, mm -hmm. snacks, like the little snacks is for people that came over. So that's what we fill these boxes with. Um, and so if somebody passes away, we're able to, um, to deliver a box to them. Also, what we have done is they have gotten involved. I think there's a, oh, I forgot the update, but I think we're in 11 different um, funeral homes. Where we'll take them off, take them and drop them to the fun drop them off at the funeral homes. Awesome. We have working relationships with them, and so if they have a family that comes in and they feel like they need a box and could benefit from it, mm -hmm. the the funeral home is able to give them the box. Um, and we are able to um, the ladies that do that for me, they will also take the funeral home directors fresh baked cookies and stuff. So they always like for the see them come, and so that <laughs> interaction. But um, that's what the box is. Okay, now tell me, tell us okay. uh, a little bit about love and lemonade. I'm going to go through all of these, you know that. Okay, you're good, you're good. Oh, so, lemonade. Love and Lemonade is our summer feeding program. So we do, um, it started out of, the, out of um, we had a food pantry for many years. They, the food pantry at Harvest has served like 91,000 people um out of their food pantry over the years and so but we found like a drop a drop in the need for actual food because there's so many food pantries around us mm -hmm. so they just said well let's rethink outside the box or what can we do different and so it started out um on tuesdays where we bring a big grill out we set it up in the parking lot we have some of the ladies and gentlemen they fresh squeezed cases of lemon <laughs> cases of lemons is we're not serving, we're not going to serve nobody what we're not going to eat. Um, but we wouldn't eat and drink. So we have, they, we buy cases of lemons and they squeeze all these lemons and we make fresh squeezed lemonade. Sometimes we can go through 20 gallons of lemonade or more. <laughs> and we also make um, fresh brewed tea and we'll grill hamburgers and hot dogs. Um, and they're, it's all free. So we make these little bags up. I didn't bring a bag, a little brown bag up. And inside that bag will have like a like a cookie. It'll have a cookie. It'll have a bag of chips. 
and what's we'll, off the grill we'll bring the either hamburger cheeseburger or hot dog they get one of the way we ask them for one sometimes they ask us for more we'll slip an extra one in there but especially our working men who come around yeah. and so anybody who wants food can just drive up and get it there's no questions asked we, mm -hmm. we do ask that you actually are there on campus or either in the car before we give but sometimes you have families unless we really know know them in the community they'll want 10 or 11 bags and we're like okay mm -hmm. you need to be here let's yeah. try to cut yeah. down on some of that um mm -hmm. and we give them fresh we give them we have popsicles out there for the kids so the kids can you know we'll give them popsicles and there's we're there for mm -hmm. prayer a lot of times people will come up and ask for prayer we mm -hmm. have added um to that ministry we have also added a clothing donations Mm -hmm. and so we set up tables we have a lady in the church who empties out um uh storage units oh she yeah brings all the clothes she washes them cleans them up she brings the clothes and we could hand out four and five hundred pieces of clothes every week um to people in the community who need clothes clothing mm -hmm. um so that's set up there too it's a it's exciting we love it so what the biggest thing that happens with that too, is we have people lined up along the, we're on the street side. And so we line up on the street and we have signs that say free, free lunch, free food, fresh lemonade. And we'll wave at the people as they drive by. Um, just that encouraging and that smile, they'll, they, they blow back at us. They'll wave at us. They'll pull in and get food. The kids mm -hmm. love to participate in it. Um, so that's our summer one that runs from June to um, the end of August, September. The first part of September. Okay. Um, now, I, I see that we're kind of running out of time, so I need to ask yeah. you a couple of more questions. Okay. I know that you have a passion for the work of God and serving humanity. I don't know how many years I've known you, but I, I've known you for quite a while. My hair wasn't nearly this white when I first met you. Mine didn't and, have either. <laughs> You have a very rich history in working, and I know this. I know this because it translated itself into your professional career at Coker University. You don't care about biopsychosocial status. No. You are one of the most unbiased people I've ever met in my life. And I had, this is not ethnic or, or or racial bias. I'm talking about whether a person has absolutely nothing, whether a person has body odor, whether a person, I mean, you are just, God, you're so sweet. And I thank God for having been a, a, a one of the people who he put in your life. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? In the back of my heart and mind, I still want my PhD. <laughs> um, and so I, I do want that. Um, but I struggle to where I, I'm like, do I really need it? Because I, could I spend that time serving more people or do I need this piece of paper? So I, I have that struggle. So that, you know, if God God sees fit and gives me clear direction that that's what I need to do, then I will go for it. Um I'm still, I still have that in the back of my mind. The other part is I, I really, I've gotten into the counseling part of that and I see how the benef how beneficial it is um, for kids and families to be that family mm -hmm. support. I don't think I've ever really saw it as much as I have since I've had this current job with youth villages. Because mm -hmm. um, a lot of the people I meet, they're part of churches. I mean, these kids come up in churches or their parents come up in churches and things. And God's always showed me that even before I went back to school, well, as I was going back to school, that what that he was going to take the church world and the social social work world and he was going to merge them together for me. And he's already doing it and has, has been doing it for years. Um, and so I, I really the part of the things on my mind a lot is go ahead and getting getting my full license as um, a licensed counselor, um, maybe a future retirement plan. <laughs> And, and but doing that from the church perspective and out of the church, out of that faith based, not just faith based organization, but a Pentecostal faith based organization where mm -hmm. you can you can empower them of what they really need, which is Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's, I mean, we have a lot of faith-based organizations and that's great, but a lot of them, you know, they start to teeter away and fall away from what, what people really, really need. And that's that relationship with Christ. Yes. Um, I'm just being honest with you. That's my heart. Yeah. And it, and it is to have that fully functioning seven days a week, um, uh -huh. community outreach center. I really believe that God's going to do it. He's already, he's, it's already unfolding. Uh -huh. Um, and uh -huh. so that's, that's, I guess I answered your question. I'm not sure if I did or not, but that, that's it. It's kind of a difficult thing, but um, I really enjoy, I enjoy the macro side of social work and I enjoy the mi micro side. And uh -huh. I believe you can't do one without the other. And I would love to see that birth out of the, out of a church and, and be an example for other churches. You can, we can do this. We yes. can be an example for so long. Churches have been, well, let them do that part. Let them do that. Let the world do that part. We're supposed to be right in the middle of all of it. Yes. 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 Now I um, haven't said anything, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit transparent now okay. because I remember when I first met you, I was teaching intro to research and advanced research. Yes. And you took my class. Yes. And I asked you, I said, what in the world are you doing in this class? You're a psychology major and you've already taken research. And um, what did you say to me? Or what was I, your wanted, I, wanted to see, I wanted to see what was different. I wanted to see, I really wanted to see what the difference was between the two, two researchers. And also everybody always said you were tough and I wanted to know what the deal was. Um, and it was, it was, I really, I love your research class. Um, I really did. I, I learned so much and, you know, under you, you mean, you, you might not realize how big of a mentor you are to me, even to this day. I remember when I graduated Coker and I was on the campus of USC and they were, har they were harassing me. They were harassing me, telling me that, you know, what you doing here? You shouldn't be here. You, I'm like, what do you mean? And I remember call, I remember being in tears and calling you from the orientation that day. And you're like, you're where you're supposed to be. Don't worry about them. You got this. And those words of encouragement, even across the, I mean, things that happened at Coker when I was there and you were that voice of encouragement and calm. And, you know, I just, I, 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 I just, I admire you and I admire what you do in your life. And, you know, and everybody always said, Dr. Motley's mean, Dr. Motley. I didn't think you were mean at yeah, all. Yeah, I was, I'm not going to say what my nickname was, but yeah. Yeah, I did, but I, did, I, I think the biggest change for me in understanding a little bit about is when I, I was standing outside of your door one day, I think I was waiting on Dr. Cook, but I was standing outside of your door and there was a whole article written about you on the wall. And I read that article about your life and I'm like, she's not mean. What it is, is she's been through it and know you can, and she ain't going to take no slack off of you. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to do it too. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I can respect that. And I, and I know I. Oh, Tasha. I am who I am today because of your influence in my life. Um, and especially in the social work world, that influence um, is, is, is huge. Because I'm like, if you you can do it, if I did it, you can do it. Come on, come on. And I, I learned when I it came after reading reading your bio before I even really met you. I read it on the wall, and I was like, what is this? You know, everybody was scared of you. Everybody was scared. <laughs> your class is awful. I'm like, I loved your classes. I learned yeah. so much because, you know, you challenged us to go deeper and dig deeper. Um, and so that's the, the thing I do with, with people and young people. Um, I, I really feel like, you know, we can go deeper. We, we let these kids off too easy. Yes, we do. Put them in, put them in places, put them in places to work, especially mm -hmm. in the church, young ages. Mm -hmm. We want to pass them off, put them behind the sounds. That sound system costs money. Put them back there with somebody and start working and training them. Because when they develop that relationship with the church or with God and with you, they'll stick around. You ain't going to worry about them leaving later. Exactly. They'll, they'll exactly. stick around. You, we got to go. We got to go deeper. 
in the that is so, so true. And the other thing I want to say is you and I became colleagues. Yes. We worked together. And after you finished USC, you came back and I was on that search committee and you started your career in higher education. And at that time, I was, I think I was still department chair. I think we were still a department. Yeah. And then while you were there, we went under behavioral sciences due to a, a, a realignment. But I enjoyed working with you. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed working with you. So I can say it. I know for a fact, you didn't just talk the talk. You walked the walk. Thank you. And it is my pleasure. It is my distinct pleasure to have God have put the two of us together for not just for, um, I don't think actually it was just for the students at Coker. I do think that it was also for the students that you work with because we used to pray together. Right. Mm -hmm. And we know that prayer works. Right, right. And so I've seen how God has worked in your life. And I know the person that you are, you have made sacrifices for your family, for your students, for your community, for your church. And I just am so happy that you were on uh this platform and if anyone has any questions i'm sure amanda will be more than happy to answer any question just please type your questions in the chat send her some hearts she deserves hearts all the hearts that you can send up for her because she is a genuine person and when i first met her i was a little bit intimidated because she was I said, oh my God, you put a preacher in my class. <gasps> Intimidated. You know how nervous I've been all week? <laughs> like going back to class again. What? Oh, my God. Oh, I have been nervous God. all week. I was texting the pastor earlier. I was like, pray, just pray, just pray. <laughs> well, this this is, is really, really very, very good. And I have to have you back. I'm going to be doing some topics in the future that I will need your expertise when it, it comes honor. to adolescence. It would be an honor. Be an and honor. I know that you are and you do have the expertise to work with, as I said, um, children and adolescents, regardless of biopsychosocial classification, you are chosen of God for the work that you do. And I thank and praise God for you. Um, I call you Amanda, but what do they call you at your church? Are you a bishop now? Oh, gosh, no. I'm just Mandy. <laughs> they call me Pastor Mandy here, but I'm like, I'm just Mandy. I'm, I'm not using the title thing. Um, you have a question. Uh, Commissioner Randall J. White says, what's your greatest challenge and how do you believe that you can overcome that or we will, I guess, overcome that in the work that you do? Probably the biggest challenge in the work I do is probably myself. <laughs> um and a lot of it is that is is myself and believe because as much as you know dr motley has said you know the things about me other people have said those things but believing it and having that confidence um that you are making a difference and you are and i see it but it's just like really is it really working is it really happening um and i think that's for a lot of us is is our own ourself getting out of the way getting myself out of the way and let god do what god's got to do Mm -hmm. um and i think that's a a, a lot in, in every one of our lives is is me i mean i can say a lot of other things i can say it's the children it's the families it's meeting on certain times it's my schedule 
But at the end of the day, it's me. If I wake up, put God first and do what I'm supposed to do, the day flows right. But those days I don't, I'm stumbling out the door and falling. And, you know, I'm like, okay, God, get in the car. Like, hey, God, we got to do this right. Sorry, let's hit the reset button. Um, yeah. But, yeah. You, you you know, God will lead us. And if we listen, if we listen, God will help us. Mm-hmm. You know, and sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm hard headed. I love people. Yeah. I love kids. But I am hard headed and stubborn when it comes to myself. And that that self that self care, um, that taking that break and taking that self care and it is it, you know, it's a social, social work life, <laughs> ministry yeah. life, ministry. Yeah. There's there's not much difference between ministry and social work. It, it's <laughs> it all comes together. And uh, Lady Melissa Fields, Washington D.C., who has just finished uh, writing a book. We're waiting for it to come out so I can have her back on. Says. You've given us so much to think about. Thank you for challenging us. The, that the one, thing, you. one thing I, w- I would, would like to say real quick, I know we got to get off, but um, and it's really on my heart about this is it doesn't, it doesn't take much to love people. Um, it doesn't take much to be present in their lives. And everybody wants um, to belong and to be loved. And out of every all the outreach stuff that we do and we we've done in the church, I felt I fell right into the middle of what God was already doing, and able to help care help move it forward. Um, but it's loving people. It's not it's not it's not all the labels, all the you know, the judgment and that kind of stuff. It's using the, the love and grace of God and loving people. Um, be involved if you got kids. Be involved in the kids' lives. Be all up in the middle of their lives because that's a lot of the things I'm seeing with the anxiety and depression and stuff is um, with these young people, even with the adults, the families, they're always in a cell phone. They're always in a phone. They don't communicate. Um, exactly. And the hard, the hard thing, the reality of that opened up to me one day when I was in a family home and I had to teach a 16 year old how to have a conversation. And it was basically to walk, just just a simple conversation of walking by someone and saying hi in a store. The anxiety had her shut down so much where we literally practiced every day for two weeks, walking across mm-hmm. each other in the living room. Hi, how are you? Because she thought a conversation had to have so much more in depth. I'm like, no, all you do is say, hey, and walk off. Mm-hmm. You don't have to mm-hmm. go in depth. Um, these kids need us to pay attention. Yes. They need to know when kids yes. don't kids don't feel like they belong in their own home because mom and dad are always on the phone. Mm-hmm. They're always doing something else. So they feel like they're a bother. We we have check on your kids. I hope yes. that's not happening on this platform, but check on your nieces and your nephews and your grandkids and your neighbor kids. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's nothing but you know, anybody can do outreach. When you go out your front door. Um, Sam's Club has, or either Walmart has these boxes of popsicles, like 500 little tiny little, little cheap popsicles. Freeze them in the freezer. Go out the door and hand them out to the neighborhood kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's it's simple. It's simple. Yeah. Just yeah. showing somebody you're there. It's not hard. Thank you so much for being here. And I, if there are any prayer requests that anyone has, um, I'm sure that. And I'm sorry, I call her Amanda. I'm so used to calling her Amanda. Yeah. Um, Mandy has, I'm sure she will pray with you. And um, we'll give you a, a minute or so. If you have prayer requests that you'd like to put um, in the chat for her. And if there are no prayer requests, I have one. Amanda, I would like for you to please pray for my son, you know, George, Mm -hmm. I like to pray for my son that um, God will save his soul. And I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, He's my, he's my child. And I want him healed. I want him delivered and set free. You want to pray now? Yes. Okay. I must gracious Heavenly Father, right now, God, you see Dr. Motley, you see your son, George, God. God, you see every need that's going on in his life that's stopping him from 
coming to you, Father. I pray right now that every hand of the enemy that is binding him up those strongholds that are in his life, Father, you start breaking them right now. God, and let him understand and see the need he has for you, God, that nothing in his life will ever run right and go right well without you, God, because you are our breath, you are our need. You are our love, God. You are the one. We have a part in us, God, that wants to serve you, God, that wants to be a part. And we'll never be whole until we have a relationship with you, Father. I pray right now, every stronghold in George's life, God, you start tearing those things down. God, break those strongholds, break those ties of fam of people and friends that he doesn't need to be around, God. God, start removing them. Start removing them. Let him see the need that he has for you and come back to the way that he was raised, God, God to love you, Father. And in your name, we pray right now for George, God. You yes. minister to him right where he is right now this night, God. You can go yes. to him right where he is, Father. God, and show yourself to him, God. Let him have an experience with you like never before, God. Where he yes. knows it's you, Father. A transformational experience with you, God. Set him free, Father. Heal him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Yes, God. God. A complete turnaround, God. A three, 180 degree turnaround, God, where it's all about you, God. And his life overflows into other people's lives, Father. Yes. In your name we pray. Amen. We have time for another. Uh, this is coming from Jackie Clark Williams. And she's wanting you to pray for Mother Kathy Woodley who is in the hospital and we're about, uh, I guess we have another minute okay. or so. I'm writing them down so I can pray later too. Sorry. Yeah. Um, God, you see Sister Kathy right now. God, Sister Kathy Woodley, God, we pray right now. God, whatever's going on in her body, Father, you are a healer, God. God, you you know what's going on, and you can make you made her body, Father, and you know what's working and what's not working in her body. Right now, Father, I pray that you redirect, God, and you transform whatever is going wrong, God, and heal it in the name of Jesus. God, give her strength in her body. God, give her encouragement, Lord. God, and let her look to you, Father, for everything that she needs, Father. We pray right now that you move to her body in that room where she is, God. Encourage her, encourage her family. God, give her strength to get up off of that yes. bed, Lord. Yes. Out, God, in your name we pray, amen. And one other brother, Charlie Clark, to get the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God, you see, brother Charlie, God, and the Holy Ghost is a gift from you. Now, all he's got to do is receive it, Father. We pray right now that you align his heart and his mind, God, to receive the gift of life, God, that you have you're wanting to give him that gift that, um. That comforter, God, that you, you are wanting to give, Father, it's a free gift, Father. We pray right now that his mind will line up, God, to be able to accept and receive and be able to speak forth the language that you were trying to give him. We pray right now, Father, that you help Charlie, help Charlie be able to receive it, Father, because it is a gift and it's free. He yes. doesn't have to work for it. He doesn't have to do anything else for it, God, but to surrender his life, total surrender to you, God. God, and you will fill him with the prep, with the hmm, with the power of the Holy Ghost and fire, in your name we pray. Amen. And one, this is the last one. Commissioner Randall J. White, uh, pray for the work we're doing in Chicago with our youth. And this will be our last one. We're going to have to log right. off. God, you see the work that's going on in Chicago. God, you see the workers that are going out in the field, God, and the youth that are there that are ready to receive. God, I pray right now for revival to break forth and go from one side of that city yes, to the God. other, God. God, yes, let revival God. be birthed in those young people, God, where they can go out oh, and they yes. inspire to tell, God. God, not only save them, God, but sanctify them and fill them with the mm -hmm. Holy Ghost and give them a desire to, God, witness to others, God. Yes, God, Lord. encourage your servants that are there working with them, Father. Give them strength in their body. We bind every stronghold that will come against them. We bind the principalities that are in the air that yes, try to Lord. stop what's going on. So we pray right now, Father, that you reach down, God, and empower those young people to go ahead and start working, God. Go ahead and start teaching. Go ahead yes, and start God. Calling, God. God, you, Lord, and empower them with the things that they need, God, the languages yes, God. they need, the, the encouragement, the we bind all the insecurities right now, God, and empower them with the Holy Spirit to be able to move and walk, God, 
just like you did on the day of Pentecost, God. Empower these young people, God. I want to hear revival breaking forth and spreading like fire. Not only in Chicago, God, but let it spread across the United States. God. Oh, yes. God, from the top to the bottom, God, we need revival in our young people, God. Revive us, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have thoroughly enjoyed you. Uh, we got kind of uh, delayed in starting. And now I understand why. I understand why it was fought so hard at the beginning because you have blessed us. And anyone who catches this replay will yeah. be blessed as well. So I, I thank you. I'll be in contact with you. Did they put your contact information up? So that if anyone wants to get in contact with you about the programs you're doing, yeah, yeah, please do. Um, I don't know. Me, I could kind of type it in this thing right here. I don't know where to type it. Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm gonna type it here. I don't know. I can give it to you. My name is um, it's Amanda McLaughlin. My email address is Mandy M A N D Y. I don't know where to type it. Uh, my email address is. I don't know if it goes here or not. Okay, uh, there's a comment section here. Do you see oh, it? Oh, I see it now. I'm in the wrong one. I see it. I see it. Okay. okay. Oh, I didn't see all that click earlier. On, okay. Click on comments and type it in there, Mandy. I don't know where to type it. It's not looking. Okay, it's not letting me type it. I don't see a way to type. Um, I, I, can go, I can go back on and put it in the comments on the other thing. Um, but it's it's Mandy M A N D Y at H C F is the letter H the letter C the letter F at not um H C F Knox is K N O X all one word H C F Knox um dot com yeah no yeah dot com um and yeah that's it and um. My phone number is 843. Everybody has it, so it doesn't matter. It's 843-617-5318. Um, for free to call, I will say this. If you call me and I don't know the number, sometimes I don't answer. Just text me and tell me who you are and where the reference, and I'll call you back because every client has my number in South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee have my number. <laughs> I've not changed it since I was like, oh I had the same number since I was like 20 years old. So <laughs> yeah, everybody has it. So just give me a reference and I'll, I'll be, I'll respond to you. Um, yeah. Everything that we do, we, we, we volunteer, share it. Um, yeah. There's, there's nothing we, we hold back. We'll let you have it. We'll tell you about it, how to get it, the resources and where to get it from. We're in it together. Thank you again, Amanda, so, so, so much. I'll be in touch with you. And thank you all for logging in on tonight. We have, I know that Lady Victoria has to go, so I'm not going to uh, be long-winded about, thank you, thank you. Please take a look at that. Uh, we have Pentecost fire burning strong. We have a shut-in on Zoom, and we begin from 10 to 11 with praise and worship. At the top of each hour, there will be a dynamic man of God who will bring the word and then take us down on our knees for prayer, coming back up and moving forward, and we will close out at 7 o'clock in the morning. So please, 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 please join us. Amanda, help us spread the word. Help yes. others log in. Those of you who are on here, please help us spread the word because we have a prayer revival. This world needs prayer. This, and we need to pray for our children, pray for our leaders. Um, I'm going to shut up because I know, oh yes, thank you, Lady Victoria. Um, we also, in our next voices, mosaic voices from the community, we have Chelsea Johnson, who is going to be our guest talking about church hurt. Mm. Church hurt, a very real phenomenon in 2022. 
Thank you so much. Love y'all. Pray for this platform that God makes it what he wants it. Mosaic. We go.